Hey class. So next week is our first exam, next Tuesday, so we have uh, exactly a week. I will be posting the review for exam one sometime before midnight tonight, and uh, we can go over that on Thursday. So the material we cover today will be the, the last new stuff for the exam. I had debated whether or not to give you a homework assignment this week. Uh, my, my plan was going to be to give you an assignment every week that uh, we didn't have an exam and that I got around to it, right? But um, I, I didn't want to cover relations on the exam without giving you a homework. But I thought, well, giving you a homework just so that I can test you on this material is probably you know, not <laughs> the most fair thing, right? So we'll only be going over the, uh, the principal ideas, like definitions, and uh, you know, the, uh, the exam is going to be take home. Uh, I was originally going to give you uh, about a day to complete it, or, or you know, a day and a half, or whatever. Uh, but um, it, since I, I would really uh, like to encourage each of you to become familiar with LaTeX, and I know that whenever you're first starting out, that most the the majority of of the time that you spend is actually just learning how to um, you know use the syntax in order to to express these. These, uh, mathematical concepts. Uh, so I thought that I would extend the time on that um, and so rather than giving you just a day for the exam, uh, for at least this first exam, uh, while you're still getting familiar with the syntax and stuff, uh, I thought I would give you a little bit more time. Um, so uh, the the plan is to, to actually give you a week, so it'll be um, uh, the same timeline as a homework but it'll cover a wider range of questions. It is take home. Uh, it won't be, um, I, my expectation is that given all of the resources that you have available and the time, uh, that this will, will be a very reasonable first exam. Uh, I do plan to shorten the time uh, available to you for future exams, but again, since it's this first one, and since I'm encouraging this new technology, I wanna make sure that I give you time for it. Uh, and then additionally, I also want to make sure that each of you feels pretty comfortable uh, with your grade going into the, the second pass through the course. Uh, so again, we haven't covered uh, graphs or, or trees yet. We, we kind of glossed over them early on. Uh, but uh, so if you include that, you know, even though we're not testing over it, uh, then our coverage of relations will kind of complete the the, the spectrum of content that we'll go over during this course. Um, but I do hope that between exam one and, and exam two that we have the chance to go over uh, you know, the same material but kind of build on some theorems and, and use the material to, to prove some stuff uh, in addition to uh, studying the algorithms more as well. Uh, so uh, we'll do a bit with with theory uh, in the uh, between exam one and exam two, uh, but really I would like to uh, to also go back through and and start to uh, use programming concepts more as well to to just write code and hopefully help you familiarize yourself with that. Um, so we'll see how it plays out. Uh, I've, I'm uh, probably about two lectures behind where I wanted to be. Uh, in terms of uh, covering this material, but um, I, I still feel like we're keeping a pretty good pace as well. So, uh, okay, so let's jump into it. We have to finish up chapter eight, our uh, advanced counting. And then, uh, so we'll, I believe that ends with the principle of inclusion and exclusion. And then uh, we will cover relations, uh, and, and these are just, you know, coordinate pairs, essentially, um, you know, but we, um, we use broad language in, in order to discuss it, uh, so that it can be adapted uh, to some general sense. So, it, and that's pretty much the case with every course that you're taking, where um, you're already familiar with the concepts, like you, you learned a, a fair amount of it just in high school, but um, without the, the formal language to discuss it in general terms. So it, 
uh, it takes what is very comfortable it makes it uncomfortable uh, so I, I do uh, try to make sure to, to pull out uh, for the notes and, and these lectures uh, examples that'll help digest some of this new terminology as we go over it so uh, okay let's jump into it uh, I will post the, the exam review uh, sometime within the next 24 hours uh, and, and we'll go over it next week uh, and then uh, again there won't be a homework this week or, or next week but the exam will be next week and you'll have about a week to work on that so uh, okay uh, okay so hopefully uh, the text is large enough I, I realize that um, you know <laughs> that uh, it's basically impossible to read the text uh, as it was if you're trying to watch these lectures on your phone or, or really anything other than uh, full size on a monitor. So uh, my apologies for that. It, uh, it had been pointed out to me and yet somehow it, it still didn't occur to me that I needed to zoom in. But uh, okay, we'll, we'll try working with this. Um, okay, so the principle of, of inclusion and exclusion, uh, we, we kind of covered it earlier whenever we discussed the subtraction rule that uh, if you're merging two sets that are, if you perform a union operation on two sets, that the size of the output is not necessarily uh, the sum of the sizes of the inputs. Uh, and so uh, if you think of that as, um, you know, uh, if, uh, okay, so if you have a school and, and you merge two classes together, well, none of the students that were in class A were also in class B, and so they are fully disjoint sets of students, uh, and so the, the output is exactly the same size. But if you, um, I don't know, uh, if you were to merge, uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't want to pick on them. Um, if you were, were to merge, uh, you know, interest groups or something like that, so, uh, the the computer scientists uh, or you know the um, uh, the ACM right uh, with uh, the the Harry Potter fan club or, or something like that right uh, where the uh, there there might be some overlap then uh, the size of the, the resultant meeting this these merged meetings uh, might be less than uh, the number of of individuals that attended them separately, right? Like, and it's that overlap that we have to correct for. Uh, and so the subtraction rule that we discussed earlier dealt with correcting for that overlap whenever uh, there was just, uh, uh, whenever there was just two sets. Uh, right, so uh, size of set A plus the size of set B, uh, and then you subtract the intersection. Uh, and so this was an example of that. Uh, okay, so it, can't we just use that whenever we have more than two sets? Uh, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we do, uh, but it turns out that uh, once you start dealing with more than two sets, you start having to deal with combinations of corrections, right? So, so this first example shows, well, okay, so as before, now we're adding the, uh, the size of the sets together, and then we're removing each of the pairwise uh, intersections, right? So, uh, so now, uh, so if we were to, uh, uh, to take all of the interest groups, right? So the the Harry Potter fan club, the Lord of the Rings fan club, the you know um, Star Wars fan club, or whatever, right? And we said, okay, well now they all have to meet in the same room at the same time. We just that's just how it's going to have to go. So how many name tags do we need, right? <laughs> and so it's one name tag per person. Uh, okay, so your first guess is to add up the size of each of the groups individually. And then you remove the people that were both in the Star Wars and the Harry Potter fan club. And then the 
Lord of the Rings and the Star Wars fan club and Star Wars and Star Trek. But then you might have removed, you might have overcorrected, right? We discussed this. And so then you have to fix it by adding back in the members that were removed too many times. And this pattern increases and you have to do it, essentially you have to create these corrections for, uh, so you have your initial guess and then your first correction is in pairs and then your next correction is with the opposite sign in triplets and then the next correction would again flip the sign back to subtracting uh, in quadruplets right, in, in the intersections of four sets and so forth and you have to perform those corrections until uh, until you reach the last step where you're taking where you're correcting uh, for the members that are in the intersection of all possible sets now in the case where we're using the subtraction rule this last step you know there were just two right so so it looked like this but really it was this first part your initial guess and then this last part but because in uh, in plus one or because in was two then this term this one that you know the sign function right here which flips with every uh, increased value of n uh, it uh, uh, it was negative, right? So it was your initial guess, which added up the two sizes of the two sets individually, and then you corrected by subtracting the intersection of all sets, right? Or if we had done three sets, then this last term would have been adding back in, right? So it would have been these three steps. But anyway, so so it's just an initial guess and then a series of corrections, and the corrections can stop once you finally accounted for the members that are in all of the in the intersection of all of these uh, sets uh, okay so um, so we think we understand what that says right so let's take a look at it uh, so application of inclusion and exclusion so at some point some of you may have come across the sieve of Eratosthenes which is a method for filtering out composite numbers uh, between uh, from well from one right up until some value in uh, and for examples in is usually uh, or K or whatever is usually a uh, hundred sometimes it's a thousand uh, when I do this uh, as a program I, I use a thousand and um, so it it filters out the composite numbers and then it leaves you with just the primes. And so uh, this um, this application, you know, what we're about to discuss, is uh, a way to look at it in terms of sets. Uh, and so uh, the composite numbers are going to be broken up into the multiples of each of the prime numbers. So the multiples of two, the multiples of three, the multiples of five and the multiples of seven and obviously if you just consider uh, the set of the first 100 integers right so from 1 to 100 then uh, you know one we, we know just we, uh, it is a, a multiplicative identity uh, so we don't consider it prime uh, it used to be considered the, or you know, in some contexts, it's considered the zeroth prime, but uh, let's not, right? <laughs> so, uh, so we'll say that that two is the first prime, and that begins our our discussion of the primes. Right? Uh, and so, uh, the properties, right? Like we'll discuss p as as representing some property. Uh, the property is that p one is a multiple of prime number one. P two is a multiple of prime number two pn is the multiple of the nth prime. Uh, so here, uh, yada yada yada, uh, right, yeah, so on and so forth. Uh, and so now we have this notation for uh, the number of elements that satisfy this property and this property and this property. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, and then 
P prime is going to be the complement of that property. So if uh, P1 is the multiples of 2, then P prime, or P1 prime, uh, is the uh, numbers that are not multiples of 2. Uh, so we would say the even numbers and the odd numbers. Um, it, P2 is the multiples of 3, and P2 prime is going to be uh, the numbers that are uh, not equal to 0, are not equivalent to 0 mod 3, um, so forth. So, uh, so this is the notation that we use for that. So then this is now the, the number of elements that do not, or that satisfy not P alpha 1 prime, not P alpha 2 prime, and so forth. Uh, so these are our prime numbers, right? If it is not a multiple of prime of the first prime, and it's not a multiple of the second prime, and it's not a multiple of the nth prime here, uh, then it's not a multiple of any other prime, which is exactly our definition of a prime number. Um, so uh, we've defined n, so we chose 100 for this example, uh, as equal to the size of our set. Right, so the numbers from 1 to 100. So uh, the size of our set is equal to our prime numbers plus uh, the, uh, the all of the composites. Right? And so the A1 is the set of multiples of 2, A2 is the set of multiples of 3, and so forth. Uh, and so the union operator, uh, it uh, it removes duplicates, right? So sets, by definition, are, are distinct sets, right? uh, as opposed to collections or arrays where values may repeat. Um, OK, so then just simple arithmetic, the number of prime numbers is equal to our overall set size, so 100 in this case, minus all of the composite numbers. Uh, OK, so. Right, again, now we get to see the principle of inclusion and exclusion. So we can compute uh, this, the number of primes, uh, by first solving this. And we need, in order to get the size, the number of composite elements, uh, we break the problem down individually. So this, according to the principle of inclusion and exclusion, is equal to uh, that initial guess, which is adding up the size of all of the sets individually and then removing the uh, the size of the intersections and then correcting for the ones that were in three sets and then so on and so forth and, and continuing with our corrections until uh, we get the numbers that were multiples of all of them. Uh, so, uh, so if we restate that, right, if we come back to this equation then the number of primes is equal to our overall set size minus uh, the number of composites. But we've redefined the number of composites as this. So minus this becomes minus this plus this, and so on and so forth. So it's, um, yeah, it's this, but with the sign flipped because of this negative right here. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so now uh, we use that. We extend that idea to create a prime counting function. Uh, the Euler totient function, I think. Yeah, totient is, I believe, Latin for how many. <laughs> so he just, uh, yeah, he used the letter phi and the, the prime counting function. Uh, so we can create that using the set arithmetic. Um, is it is not more efficient? Uh, I mean, it's a, a subset of the sieve, or it's we derive its results by applying the sieve of veritosity. So if we actually wanted the number of elements 
of prime numbers less than a given set, um, we wouldn't necessarily, like this wouldn't necessarily be the, the best case. If we already have the number, like if we've already filtered out the prime numbers, uh, we would just uh, count that instead of using this arithmetic. But we're showing like in an application, right? Like just so conceptually, what is it that we've been talking about with inclusion and exclusion and all of these corrections and so forth. And so this is just uh, kind of contriving an example in, in order to help you understand that. Uh, but it, you know, it, it does help with the visualization, right? So, okay, so we want the number of primes not exceeding 100. Uh, and so, uh, so all of this just basically says that uh, we don't need, uh, in order to create this filter for composite numbers, uh, we only need the primes less than or equal to the square root of k, right? where k is 100 in this case. Uh, and the reason this is so is if you consider k is equal to a times b, right? uh, and if a times b uh, is, so if a is greater than the square root of k, right? Well, uh, and uh, or uh, as if b is also greater than the square root of k, then a times b is going to be greater than k, right? So, uh, so what that's saying is that uh, if you go beyond the square root of k with either term, right? So even if this was equal to the square root of k, uh, then a value a, which is larger than the square root of k, uh, is going to be, like, it, you're just going to get a product that's larger than what we were initially wanted, right? So this is the formal way of saying, well, we, we just don't need to test any values larger than the square root of k, right? Uh, and since uh, the properties that we're testing are, are prime numbers, then we only need the prime numbers that are less than or equal to the square root of 100, since k equals 100, uh, which is 10, right? So the prime numbers less than 10 are 2, 3, 5, and 7, right? So uh, property of 1, it means that it's an even number. It's divisible by 2. Property 2 means it's a multiple of 3. Property 3 means it's a multiple of 5. And property 4 means it's a multiple of 7. Uh, okay, uh, so then uh, the number of elements uh, which satisfy not a multiple, not property one, right? So not a multiple of two, not a multiple of three, not a multiple of five, and not a multiple of seven uh, is going to be represented by this. Uh, and then uh, we have four because of our four prime numbers plus each of these numbers, right? Uh, so, um, okay, uh, because uh, two is a multiple of two, three is a multiple of three, five is a multiple of five or whatever. So our four, the four prime numbers that we're using to, uh, as part of our sieve, uh, would be filtered out by these conditions, right? So we have to add them back in because we're, we're counting primes. Uh, so the prime count is this. Um, okay, so um, so our set A uh, ranges from two to one hundred because we're filtering out uh, one, right? We've identified that as our identity, uh, and so uh, we really only care about the other ninety-nine numbers. So back to our original formula, right? Uh, or one hop from our original formula. Uh, the number, or yeah, the, the number of composite numbers, um, or you know, our estimate for it, uh, is uh, the number of terms which satisfy not, uh, sorry, the number of primes or, you know, less these four primes that we're, these four, right, uh, is going to be equal to the size of our set minus that summation that we were dealing 
dealing with earlier, right? So minus the size of uh, the number of the multiples of two, right? So this is that first summation, uh, plus the multiples of three, plus the multiples of five, plus the multiples of seven. Uh, then the correction, where we deal with the intersection of two sets, right? So we correct it first by adding back in uh, the terms that were multiples of both two and three, and then and then the terms that were multiples of two and five, and then the ones that were multiples of two and seven, and then the ones that were multiples of uh, five, or sorry, of three and five, and then the multiples of three and seven, and then the multiples of five and seven. And then we go back and we deal with the intersections of uh, multiples of uh, the intersections of three sets, right? Uh, and then finally we uh, make our last correction with the ones that are intersections of, of all four sets, right? So this restated is 99 minus, uh, and then we use the floor function here because uh, it's, it's simpler arithmetic. Uh, so the number of elements is the whole number of, of elements, right? So it's a uh, it's satisfied by a ratio, but it's the whole number of that ratio. Uh, and so the floor function kind of satisfies that. So there are 50 numbers that are multiples of 2 between 2 and 100. There are uh, 33 that are multiples of 3 between 2 and 100. Uh, there are 20 that are multiples of 5. And there are, uh, oh god, 14 uh, that are multiples of uh, 7, right? Uh, and so, uh, so this is that first one, right? The sizes of the initial sets. Uh, and then what does it mean for something to satisfy both of these properties, both a multiple of 2 and a multiple of 3? Well, it's a multiple of 6, right? So it's a multiple of 2 and 3, right? Uh, and so we're still able to use the floor operator on it. Uh, and then again, you know, a multiple of 2 and 5, and then a multiple of 2 and 7, uh, and then so on and so forth, right? So satisfying two of these properties in, in the current context means that we're using multiplication. Um, so property 1 and property 4, right? Uh, and so then we do the same thing again with the next line, right? So if it's satisfying three of the properties, P1, P2, and P3, then uh, it's 2 times 3 times 5, right? so on and so forth. And so, uh, so we've added that correction line, and then the last one satisfies all four is uh, 2 and 3 and 5 and 7. Right? Uh, and so these are the sizes of the sets, right? So this is this. This is this. This is this, uh, and this is this, right? Uh, and so uh, this just turns out to be uh, too large, so it's like 210 or something like that. And then this is um, 105, I think. Yeah, and so. That's why these are zeros, just uh, in order to satisfy it, it goes beyond the size of what we're considering. Right? Uh, and so then you just do the, the addition and subtraction, uh, and you discover that there are uh, 21 numbers which satisfy not a multiple of 2, 3, 5, or 7. Right? But there are 25 primes because 2, 3, 5, and 7 were all multiples of themselves, right? But we needed to add them back in to get the number of primes. Right? Uh, and so uh, that is one uh, example of a, an application of inclusion and exclusion. Uh, and so it's, again, there are probably more direct methods. Uh, so you can still use the sieve of Eratosthenes to get the number of primes um, without doing all of this set arithmetic. But the this example shows kind of why like how it is that numbers uh, you know get over included 
uh, with the initial guess. Um, so the sizes of those sets individually, I mean, it turned out to be way more. You know, what, 83, 103, 117, right? So, um, so we, we were actually at a negative number. So our original estimate was a negative amount of primes. And so we had to correct for that, right, with, with each of these other uh, correction terms. Uh, and so that got us back to uh, uh, to our filter of the the composite values. Um, so uh, so it it kind of shows you like how these numbers are included twice. And and then I think this is a really good example of like each of these properties and how it's possible for a number to be both a multiple of two and three. Right? It just means that it's a multiple of six. Uh, and so, um, this is a, I felt like this was a pretty good example. Uh, and my apologies for messing up the uh, subscripts here. It, uh, yeah, um, I'll fix that before I post. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so this is just a, another way. Um, oh. Okay, uh, so this is a, a theorem uh, that says uh, how many onto functions there are uh, from a set with m elements to a set with n elements. Uh, okay, so what is an onto function? Uh, so it uh, it is not necessarily bijective. Um, so uh, okay. Uh, so let's say that you have uh, a number of tasks, right? You have n tasks to do, uh, and you have m volunteers to do those tasks. So uh, an onto function could just be viewed as the assignment of work to those n individuals. Uh, and so the pigeonhole principle tells us that if m is greater than n, uh, then uh, more than one person is going to be assigned to the same task um, and uh, or you know at, in at least one case right uh, and so onto is just a, a restriction on uh, on that mapping that says well uh, everyone every chore has to be assigned right so uh, we are saying that you know we <laughs> You know, in this analogy, we make no guarantee that the chore gets completed, but we have guaranteed that we have assigned uh, each, or at least one individual, at least one volunteer, uh, to uh, onto you know the the set of tasks. Uh, we at least uh, one volunteer has been assigned to uh, every individual task, right? Uh, and so this tells you. Uh, how many different ways you could make those assignments uh, from uh, the the set of volunteers to the set of tasks, uh, right? Uh, and so again, in order to do that, you need uh, at least as many volunteers as there are tasks, right? So m has to be at least as as large as n. Uh, and when that's the case, then uh, this is the function that tells you uh, how many different ways you could do those assignments. Uh, okay, uh, a derangement uh, is a permutation of objects that leaves no object in its original place. Uh, I meant to go back and do the hat check problem, but uh, I've left that off. We'll deal with it another time. Uh, so, um, but uh, okay, um, if you. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, no, I don't like that example. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. 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 So uh, imagine that you're signing up for Secret Santa or you know something like that, um, and so everyone writes down their own name and they uh, drop it in a hat or you know a, a bowl or or whatever, uh, and then each person goes around and they draw a name from. The, you know, from the bowl, 
then uh, derangement is, uh, you know, despite the, the, the term, uh, is actually exactly what you're looking for in this scenario, right? So no one should get their own name. No one should draw their own name. And so uh, a derangement is a case where this condition is satisfied, where uh, no one got the name that they put into the bowl whenever they drew it out. Okay? Uh, and so the number of derangements, the number of uh, different ways that, you know, different secret Santa pairings, right, uh, is given by dn equal to n factorial times uh, this series, right, and uh, this, uh, you know, this alternating series should look pretty similar to what we were just dealing with, but, um, you know, it also <laughs> bears a resemblance to a power series uh, notation, but uh, okay, so, um, you know, that's interesting. Uh, maybe we'll do the hat check problem whenever we come back through the second time around. Uh, okay, so then uh, on to relations, right? Uh, and so uh, relations, you can just think of, you know, as a binary relation as just a, an ordered pair, right, of, you know, A, A, B, right? That, that's it. Uh, so, you know, we have all of the syntax and, and terminology or whatever, um, but you can think of them as, you know, these Cartesian pairs or, or whatever. Um, and so you have set A, you have set B, uh, and A cross B. Generally, whenever you see this term in math or, you know, now in discrete math, uh, it means that you're going to end up with something like this, right? So some element from the first set and some element from the second set. Uh, and, you know, just like whenever you're graphing something, one zero, right, one in the x direction and zero in the y direction is not the same as zero one, right? So order matters, which is why we call them ordered pairs. So uh, a binary relation from A to B is a subset of A cross B. Uh, so why do we say that? What is a subset? Uh, so uh, if you consider, uh, you know, y equals x, this is a, a function, all, all of the mathematical functions that we dealt with are, uh, are also relations. And so, uh, in that case, uh, you know, A is the real number line, right, because X has all of the real numbers. B is also the real number line, so the two sets happen to be the same, right? Uh, and so the, the X direction has all of the real numbers, the Y direction has all of the real numbers. And the binary relation uh, pairs for every value from x to some value from y. Uh, and so even though y equals x, it has every x value and it has every y value, it doesn't have every possible pair of values. So for example, uh, the, uh, the point uh, 0, 1, which is an ordered pair, and it's it's in, you know, R2, right? it's in A cross B, uh, it is not uh, a member of that relation, right, the, the Y equals X relation. Uh, and so uh, the subset is going to exclude some pairs, right? Uh, and so, you know, that's all we're saying there, but in as formal a, a way as possible. Uh, okay, so a relation on set A is a relation from A to A, right? Okay. Uh, uh, it's reflexive. Yeah, so reflexive just means that both of the values... Uh, so first, uh, you're dealing with a relation on set A. So A and B are the same again, right? So, um, yeah. Reflexive just means that both of the points in the pair are the same. Or, um, sorry, uh, yeah, that the relation anytime you have one element in R, what am I saying? Uh, yeah, so that, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how else to say it. If you're dealing with this as a matrix, then the, the diagonal is completely populated. Uh, but yeah, it, it just means that uh, the pair is in R for every element in A. It's, it's a, a definition, right? Uh, 
uh, okay, uh, symmetric, uh, if BA is an R, then AB is an R uh, for every AB that are in A. Right? And so this is a conditional, right? So it doesn't mean that, that every possible pair is in R. It means that if you have one, right, so if BA is in there, uh, then AB is in there. So again, if we're dealing with um, uh, you know graphs or, or something with you know edges, then uh, if this is source and destination, right? So if there exists a, a highway between Dallas and Austin, then there also exists a highway from Austin to Dallas, right? Like that's the symmetric requirement. Uh, Anti-symmetric. Uh, means that uh, if AB is in R and BA is in R, then that's only the case whenever A is equal to B. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's just kind of an assault on the concept of symmetry. It's like, well, you can only have symmetry if it happens to be uh, reflexive. Right? Uh, so I, I can't think of a, a example of that off the top of my head. Um, okay, uh, transitive, uh, you know, and I think you know, transit, uh, again, highways are a really good example of this. Uh, if AB is an R and BC is an R, then AC is an R, right? So uh, if, you know, there's a highway from, from Dallas to Austin and there's a highway from Austin to San Antonio, then, you know, there's a path that takes you from Austin or from Dallas to San Antonio. You know, that's the transitive property. Uh, okay, uh, so then um, composite operators, yeah. Uh, okay, so if we have some relation that relates A to B, and we have another one, so relation R, and then a relation S that takes B to C, uh, then the composite of R and S is the ordered pairs AC, right? So, um, trying to think of a good example with highways here. Um, you know, uh, yeah, so uh, I guess paths would be composite operators, right? So, um, uh, Okay, uh, I guess if you made some requirement that you know you couldn't reuse the same road or, or that you had to hit a city and then you know use a, a different highway or something like that, then the composite operation would be you know allowing you to change highways, right? So um, you know if, if the relation is that the city is accessible by I-35, you know that's R, and the other relation is that the city uh, the cities are connected by I interstate 20, then uh, the composite would be the, the cities that are connected uh, from, uh, from the first set, right? From uh, interstate 35 to those along 20, right? So, uh, so then that would be your new composite relationship. Uh, right, so you can get to it from 35 and then yeah, so the roads connected to Dallas. Yeah, that would be a good one, right? Roads connected to Dallas by 35, roads connected to Dallas by 20. Uh, then uh, these are the accessible routes that go through Dallas, basically, along those two highways. Um, and then this is the composite operator, right? So S composed of R. Uh, okay. Um, Right, and so these tend to be right applied right to left first, right? So first you would get to Dallas along 35, and then you would get to wherever along 20, right? So you you munch them from right to left whenever you're applying them. Uh, okay, uh, so let uh, R be a relation on the set A. Uh, the powers R to the N are defined recursively. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's not really saying a lot. It's just a, a notation, so don't overthink that. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, 
Okay, so this is a requirement on what it takes for a relation to be transitive. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it basically says that whenever we start relating these in, in terms of matrices later on, uh, that uh, R to the N is a, a subset of R. Uh, and so um, we'll look at closures later, and that's kind of whenever you'll get to see it uh, a little bit more, so just in a few minutes if you hang on. Um, but what it's saying is that the set, you know, this relation uh, was transitive to begin with, uh, only if uh, whenever you, you know, repeatedly perform those uh, multiplications, those matrix multiplications, uh, if it's still a subset of that original relation. Um, but that's not particularly, so, you know, that's a requirement, but it's not as interesting as being able to uh, get the transitive closure. But it, it is a, a test condition for if for any reason you needed to find out whether or not a set was transitive to begin with. Uh, so, you know, maybe we'll put that on, on that second exam. We'll see. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so then, uh, in area relations, yeah, so this is like if you, you know, uh, again, if you were using Cartesian coordinates or whatever, if you wanted to graph something in three dimensions, then uh, you would just, you know, note it uh, R times R times R, right? So you get R3, uh, and you could, in theory, graph something in N dimensions, uh, but, you know, it, uh, you're not limited to just things that you can graph. Um, so whenever we discuss relations, uh, you know, you should also keep in the back of your mind the concept of relational data and relational databases. So um, these sets, you know, um, aren't necessarily always numbers, right? So it could be uh, some, like a student ID, and then uh, student first name, student last name, birthday, and so forth, right? Um, so they're just sets. They're, they're, you know, they can be sets of dates, they can be sets of names. Uh, and so, um, you know, it, that, that's the point for the abstraction, like why it's, it, why we don't just use real numbers over and over again. But um, anyway, uh, so in, in area relation, you know, it's represented by this. Uh, the sets themselves are called the domains. Uh, and it is of degree n, right? So uh, if you have an ordered triplet, then n is 3, an ordered pair, n is 2, uh, and so forth. Right? Uh, so n is, or degree is just a, a synonym for the number of fields in your ordered tuple or your n area relationship. Uh, selection operator. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of a uh, formalization of uh, whenever we create a select statement in SQL, right? So, uh, you yeah, know, we'll come back to that, and, you know, whenever we start doing practical examples, I'll, I'll show you, you know, some actual SQL syntax, and we'll get into that. But uh, selection operator uh, is, you just have some condition, right? So I want all of the students that were uh, that graduated before the year 2010 or something like that. So that becomes your condition and then everything else kind of gets filtered out. Right? So you're, uh, yeah, you're just selecting a thing. And so this will feel abstract uh, until you get to see some more examples of it. But for now, I just want you to know that uh, there exists, you know, this concept that we can, uh, we can selectively, uh, filter down to some desired subset of a larger set of data. Uh, projection, um, okay, yeah, uh, from some N tuple to some M tuple. Uh, okay, so, you know, whenever we were up here and I was saying that it, this could represent things other than real numbers, it could represent, um, you know, names and birth dates and stuff like that. So the projection operator, similarly, uh, if we have everything that you entered on your student registration form, like your 
your mailing address, your uh, your phone number, your first name, your last name, or whatever. Then all of that is associated, you know, kind of in this record. But uh, we can project it down, uh, you know, in the way that a, a sphere, this three-dimensional object, casts a shadow down, you know, to some, you know, two-dimensional object. The shadow is just this thing that sits on a two-dimensional surface. Uh, you know, we can also project down your student record, you know, <laughs> all of your the courses that you've taken and everything else, uh, down to just uh, your student ID and your name, <laughs> right? So your a projection is just taking, uh, you know, some larger amount of information for a given record, right, for a given tuple, uh, and it's, uh, it's, you know, filtering it down to some lesser set of information uh, and uh, it is an operation right so these these values in the mathematical sense aren't necessarily going to be the same but in a uh, information science sense they probably will be the same right uh, although you know not even necessarily um, so uh, if we were to talk about uh, projecting data then uh, you have all of that information for an individual student, but you can summarize it, right? Like GPA is a summary of data. So you'd have student ID and GPA instead of, you know, uh, you know, student ID and then you know, all of this other information or whatever. And so, um, yeah, like the, in principle though, uh, a projection is, is some, filtering of information. Uh, GPA may not have been a, a great example. I just wanted to show that you could like mutate the data, but I think in terms of this, um, yeah, it, it's easier to think of uh, just taking, you know, <laughs> uh, of removing extraneous data from the, the set. Uh, so you have available to you, you know, phone number and home address and whatever, but really I just want your, your student ID and your name. All right. Okay. Uh, so that's projection. Uh, joins, uh, and this will make, a, yeah, this is so formal, this will make a whole lot more sense once we actually get down to the examples and, and you can kind of see where, like, what it is, but uh, essentially um, you're, whenever you have uh, data in a database, um, for efficiency reasons, uh, you you break it up um, based on like some some concept some topic or, or whatever right so uh, you wouldn't keep your profile information so your your name and phone number and birth date and you know parents and emergency contact or whatever necessarily uh, in the same grouping of data as you would uh, your course grades and stuff like that. So uh, the information would be broken up into, uh, it, it would be normalized into all of these different tables. And then you would have to join the data back together to get uh, a record that's representative of an individual, right? Uh, and so you have uh, something like here, uh, you know, this, these fields C or whatever uh, come from somewhere else, but you can think of these, like, I know there's more, but you could probably do it with just student ID, right? So, but potentially it, it could be more stuff. Right? But if you want to think of this as just representing your student ID, right? Or student ID and birth date or something like that, student ID and last name, uh, then uh, some of your data is in this first table, right? This first M tuple. Uh, and some other data is in the second M tuple. Uh, in tuple um, and there's this overlapping data and so this stuff would be uh, a key it would be the what relates these two these records from these two different sets like what overlaps it and if you think of it as your student ID and your or student ID and last name or you know whatever else uh, then it's uh, the record that's used to kind of stitch that data back together. So it was broken up because it's big and clunky and, and terrible to maintain if you keep it all together. Uh, but 
at some point you need to be able to get it back together. Uh, and so this is the, the formalization of, of you know, how we say that. Uh, and so that's what a join operator is. And so you can think of these as database tables. And again, that might make more sense once we actually get into the database examples. And I'll probably do that on Thursday, actually. I, uh, I know we're going to do the review and stuff like that, but I don't want to just let this sit and you know, gloss over it too much. But, um, but whenever you see join, I want you to think, you know, database. Um, and so, you know, there is this formalization or whatever, but uh, the reason we're teaching you this is to build up to, you know, working with data. Uh, okay. Uh, count and support. Uh, so this is from the section on data mining. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. So data mining in terms of like, you know, uh, <laughs> I guess you know, marketing is important and stuff like that. Targeted marketing and uh, yeah, okay. Um, but uh, you know, whenever we go back over this later, I'm just gonna uh, point out that it's here. Um, you know, whenever I want you to think of data mining, I want you to think of uh, extracting data or, you know, uh, uh, kind of what I was talking about with GPA earlier. So it wasn't a really good example for projection, but it is information that can be summarized from some larger set. Uh, and so, you know, data warehousing and I guess data mining as well um, is this concept that you're not going to be able to keep all of the information forever. Uh, so at some point, uh, you need to uh, summarize you know, whatever it is that you're working with and then uh, use the summary going forward. Uh, and so, uh, and then you'll have to use you know, domain methods or, or um, and that's not even a term, uh, you'll have to uh, you know, look at the context of, of what it is that you're doing and um, and you know try and derive uh, some methods of extracting meaningful information, you know, some summary data uh, that is useful uh, and that is also consistent on some level. Uh, so um, so yeah, whenever if we do end up going into the data mining section in more detail later in the semester, uh, I don't want you to necessarily think of it in terms of, you know, um, squeezing the individual, the customer, or consumer, or whatever for, for information. Um, you know, I want you to think of it in terms of uh, just finding meaning from uh, from vast amounts of data. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Support confidence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So now representing relations. Uh, so we're going to use matrices. Um, so this has two indices, right? So I uh, is going to be the rows, and J is going to be the columns. Um, and so uh, we can use 0, 1 matrices um, to represent whether or not the relation is satisfied. Right? We have this binary condition. So either uh, the pair is in the relation or the pair is not in the relation. Right? And so the matrix the relation R is given by this. Right? Uh, so then, and this is just a, a convenient notation for the matrix, right? So the <laughs> the bracketed object uh, with items M, I, J. Right? Uh, okay, so for an example, uh, that didn't come out either. Okay, uh, so we have uh, Set A is equal to 1, 2, 3. Set B is equal to 1, 2. Uh, then uh, the relation R, which maps A to B, is a set of ordered pairs. Uh, and our condition is that A is greater than B. Right? So uh, it's only in our, our matrix, our relationship matrix, if this condition is satisfied. Right? So, uh, in this case, this is our A, right? The, the rows, our, our row number, uh, and B is our column number, right? Uh, and so, uh, in this case, they're equal. In this case, B is greater. 
so it's going to be this lower triangular matrix. Uh, so, okay, so that's one example. Uh, another example, again, we're given our sets of elements. Uh, and then, in this case, we're given our matrix R, right? And so, our M sub R. Uh, and so, we can extract the relation, right? from the ordered pairs or from this relationship matrix. So we can go in the other direction. So here we had a condition, but you know we uh, we could use ordered pairs or whatever from this uh, and check to see whether or not A is greater than B. Uh, but we can extract the ordered pairs from the matrix if we're given that. Right? So this is the example, uh, the relation satisfied by these ordered pairs. Uh, okay, so then directed graphs, or digraphs, which I never call them, uh, are uh, they're sets of vertices together. So this is, it, it has to be both, right? It's not just the vertices. The edges are only defined if the vertices are present. So it's both the vertices and the edges together. Um, so A is the initial vertex. Uh, in some cases, you're going to have that. Uh, and then B, or I guess whenever you're drawing an edge, you're always going to have an initial vertex. So the first point, the first entry in the, the pair is going to be your origin, and the second is going to be your destination. Right? So the initial vertex and the terminal vertex. Uh, okay, and so that's for every edge. Every edge will have a starting point and an end point. Right? So, uh, okay. Uh, closures. So. Uh, these are uh, the <laughs> the completion of some particular property. Right? Uh, so formally, we say if R is a relation on set A, then the closure of R with respect to property P, if it exists, uh, is the relation S. So S is the closure on A with property P that contains R and is a subset of every set of A cross A containing R with property P. Um, okay, so you know, what was that? <laughs> what did we just say? Uh, okay, so property P is going to be one of the equivalence relation properties. So uh, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So those are going to be our three types of closures. Um, so uh, we say property P, but we mean it's one of those three things. Right? So uh, it's easier to just ignore this definition, right? Like there are other closures, right? Like um, the, so mathematically speaking, the, uh, the uh, rational numbers are the closure with respect to the division operation on the integers. Uh, so one or uh, four divided by two is two which is an integer, and so division can exist on the integers, but two divided by four is uh, one half, which is not in the integers. And so you have to introduce this larger set of numbers, the rational numbers, in order to get closure on the division operation. So that uh, two inputs from your set, right, from the integers, uh, will result in something that is also in the set. So in order to get that for division, you have to introduce the rationals. So the rationals are closed with respect to division. Uh, and then um, the real numbers are uh, closure with respect to, um, to infinite series, I guess, to the sums of, of infinite series. Uh, I, I want to say it's... Uh, probably more than that. That may not be the actual definition. Um, but uh, yeah, so just in order to get that, then um, you have to go into the real numbers. Uh, it's, I have a tendency to say it's related to roots, but pi is not necessarily the root of, of anything. Um, it is <laughs> extremely irrational. Uh, so in that case, it's it's a, a closure on the relationship between 
uh, curved arcs and straight lines. Um, you have to go into the real numbers. Uh, and then uh, the complex numbers are closure with respect to uh, square roots on, on integers. Right? So just the square root of negative 1. The square root of 4 is 2, right? which is an integer. Um, or I guess you could use rational numbers as input. Uh, but uh, there are square roots. Like if you go into the negative numbers, then uh, you need complex numbers to define it. Uh, and so, as it turns out, like that is, that's enough. So, the square root or the the in root of any complex number, it doesn't require any additional uh, numbers to represent it. it. It can represent all of those roots uh, just within it. Uh, and so, again, there are these comp these concepts of the closure with respect to some relation, right? Some operation or whatever. Um, you know, but as far as we're concerned with relations, uh, with the relations that we'll discuss, there's really just these three properties that we care about, and that's um, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Uh, so we're not necessarily discussing it in the mathematical sense, uh, so you don't have to worry about those, those other closures or whatever. But uh, I just want to say that those are the three that we'll be looking at, and those are the only three we'll be discussing whenever we talk about property P. Um, but, uh, you know, closure is a term that extends beyond just discrete math, right? Like that is a kind of a, a formal mathematical concept as well. Uh, okay, so the reflexive closure uh, is just, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if a is in A, right? So you have uh, some relation which is mapping A to A, right? So then uh, all, for all A in A, then the pair AA is in S, right? Um, don't really have a good example on that at the moment. Um, oh, well, yeah, actually I do, it's right here. Uh, so uh, we have our relation uh, that a is less than b uh, for the integers, right? Uh, the reason z is used is salient was the German word for number, uh, and so z is a number, right? It's an integer. <laughs> okay, uh, and then uh, the, so if you're wondering about that notation, then the reflexive closure on that is, well, so here uh, a, so the number or the pair 1, 1 would not be included because 1 is not less than 1. Uh, and so the closure would be to include that uh, identity mapping, right? So uh, you have the original set, right, where A is less than B, and then you have the closure of it, or the ones that, the set of numbers that satisfy that property that for every number in our set, Z, uh, that the pair a, A is also in there. Uh, and then the resultant set is that we get uh, this new condition that A is less than or equal to B. Right? Uh, so that's an example of the reflexive closure. So you have some set uh, and then you had to add some values to it to get the closure on it. Um, okay, uh, so the symmetric closure of a set R is the relation S, which contains R, with the added property P, that P is symmetric. Uh, right, so what did I just say? Uh, so if some pair AB is in uh, our closed set S, right, our symmetric set, uh, then BA is also in S. So if we're given uh, AB is in R, uh, where A is greater than B, uh, then the symmetric closure uh, is going to be um, just that A is not equal to B, right? So it's both, uh, it's originally A greater than B, but then in order to get those other numbers, right? So if you consider uh, 2 and 1, right, which would be in there, then 1, 2 wouldn't be in there because uh, one is not greater than two, right? Um, so the symmetric condition would flip that, uh, and so 
it would be B A whenever A is greater than B still, right? So the same conditions, but we've substituted B A for what was previously A B. And the result, like the, the simplification of these statements is uh, that uh, A is either greater than B uh, or, uh, you know, if we swap this, swap this condition, right, then we would say that uh, this first term is less than the second one, right? So we could have left them the same and said that A is less than B, right? So then the result is that A is either greater than B or A is less than B, right? Which is equivalent to saying that A is not equal to B. So, uh, so this is the symmetric closure on this original relation uh, on the given set, right? In this case, that would be the natural numbers. Uh, okay, uh, so then I said there was a third property, right, transitive closure that we might consider, uh, and we are kind of building up to that. Um, but first we have to introduce some new terms. So a path from A to B in the directed graph G is a sequence of edges, uh, this edge, this edge, right, and edges are pairs, right, it has a, an origin vertex and a, a destination vertex or an initial vertex and a terminal vertex. Uh, and so it's this edge, and then you know we stop at city one, and then we go to city two, and we go from two to three, and so forth, right? Uh, and then from our second to last city to our last city, right? Um, so then in this case, our first city, right, our initial city is x0, and our last city is uh, xn, right? Uh, and so the path is the sequence of edges where the terminal vertex of an edge is the same as the initial vertex uh, in the next edge in the path, right? So it's it's what you would think of in terms of like a, a road trip or whatever, right? Like your car isn't jumping locations. You drive until you stop, and then you start your next you know, segment of the trip uh, from where you stopped before, right? Or if you want to talk about whenever you leave a road, right? Well, where you left that first strip of road is where you start the new strip of road and so forth. Right? So that's a path. Uh, and then, uh, the only thing to note is that, uh, so you have uh, these n distinct vertices are, you know, starting from x0 to xn. So there's uh, n plus 1 vertices, right? uh, but in edges, right? And so the length of the path isn't the number of vertices, it's the number of uh, edges. Uh, so uh, that's consistent uh, with, with what we would say, right? So uh, so using this convention, right, the, the empty set of edges uh, is a path of length zero from A to A, right? So if you never moved your car, it has traveled a path of length zero, right? So it's it's got one vertex, it's wherever you parked it, uh, but it doesn't move, right? And so it's uh, it's got a path of length zero. Uh, okay, uh, and then uh, if you end up where you started, right? So you go to the grocery store and then you come back, then that's a circuit or a cycle. Okay, uh, okay. so we have a theory here, uh, relation R on the set A, uh, then there's a path of length n, uh, where n is a positive integer from a to b, if and only if uh, a b is in r to the n. Uh, okay, so using the the matrix representation or whatever, then we can compute r to the n, right? Uh, and so that path of that length only exists if uh, that ordered pair is in that matrix. Uh, so I think that's actually kind of a cool theorem, but uh, we don't have an example at the moment. Uh, okay, so then uh, the connectivity relation, R star, consists of the ordered pairs. Um, right, so this is, uh, I feel like we need to come back to this, right? So this is exactly the same thing as transitive closure. And the next theorem states it, right? But, you know, what is this union that we're doing here and so forth? Uh, let me just show you, right? So. Um, right, so it, it's, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll show you here in a second. Right. Uh, let's see, let A, uh, 
Uh, okay, so it's just a, another condition uh, on uh, whether or not a path exists. Right? Uh, but I, I want to show you that previous one on uh, this, right, the connectivity relation. Right? So we defined it as the union of all of those different products. right? So if we have n elements, then we don't need to multiply the matrix more than n times. So you know, what we're basically saying is that the relationship matrix on the connectivity relation is uh, our, our transitive closure. Uh, and so there's the initial relationship matrix, right? and then we can square it, we can take it to the third power, and then depending on however many elements there are, you know, if there's n elements, uh, then uh, that we don't need to take it higher than the nth power. Uh, so the example, I think, is really what's going to help. So you have this 3 by 3 matrix that explains the, the connectivity paths uh, for some relation R. Right? So we use the above theorem, uh, and we see that it takes this form. right? So it's n elements, right? so we don't need more than three terms in our, our logical or operations here. Uh, and so, uh, so we already have this, we were given this, and we can compute the transitive closure right, using this formula. So we started with this, right, that's up here, so then we square it and we get this, and then we multiply it by that initial matrix one more time, so then we get the, the cubed version of that matrix, and it happens in this example it just happens to be the same, but that's not uh, in general true. Uh, so then our transitive closure, right? so uh, the, uh, the list of roads, or the list of cities that are accessible by the interstate highway system, right, <laughs> uh, would be uh, this uh, logical or operation, right? So you have that first one, and then uh, if it's one here, or here, or here, then the the result is that it's one here, right? So if it's one here, or here, or here, then it's one here, right? So that's why it's one there. And you know, place by place, you go in and you you fill in these entries in this uh, uh, matrix on the uh, sorry, I forgot the term, the connectivity relation. Um, you know, you do that term by term, and then that is exactly the transitive closure. Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, we can pick up with equivalence relations next time. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get to work on your uh, exam review. I will have it posted. We'll try for today, but uh, it might not be until tomorrow, but being Wednesday. Uh, either way, we'll go over it on Thursday, uh, and hopefully that'll help you feel pretty solid about it for uh, the exam on Tuesday. Uh, and then again, you'll have a week on it, so uh, if there's any questions or if I feel like there's anything that was undercovered during class, then uh, you know, we'll deal with it uh, in one of those lectures. So, all right, have a good evening, everyone.